Thank you, everyone. Uh, thanks, Phil, for inviting me uh, to give this talk. It's been a great honor, and it's always hard to follow Kevin, so I'm going to do my best. So I want to talk about my research project um, and also give a plug about the uh, K-12 uh, award, which I'm fortunate to be one of the two uh, first scholars in, uh, from our institution. The other person is Dave Machado from surgery. Um, and so these are my disclosures. So the problem at hand is cardiac arrest. Uh, we know that over 430,000 patients a year suffer from sudden cardiac death in this country, and there's more internationally. We also know that even though now we have all sorts of options to restore the heart function, such as ECMO, uh, VATS, uh, total artificial heart, and transplant, that the majority of particularly the other hospital cardiac arrest death, uh, death comes from uh, neurologic injury. So you can see here from a study by Lovers in 2004, that up to two-thirds of out of hospital cardiac arrest patients die from neurologic injury, and a quarter of in-hospital in cardiac arrest uh, do so. And today, there's been no pharmacologic treatment that has been shown to improve post-arrest neurologic outcome. So valproic acid is actually a fairly old drug. Uh, it's been around for uh, more than 50 years for bipolar and seizure disorders. And it seems that I think we started using it really not knowing what its mechanism of action is are. Uh, but for the last decade or so, and particularly from the lab uh, data from uh, Dr. Alam's lab from surgery, uh, there seems to be uh, three main mechanisms that it could be protective uh, in many different diseases, uh, TBI, polytrauma, and most recently, cardiac arrest. So the first pathway could be the activation of AK, AKT and mTOR to lead to neuroprotection. Second, at a high dose, valproic acid actually serves as a uh, HDAC inhibitor or histone deacetylate inhibitor. And so it enwraps the DNA from the chromatins, chromatins to actually lead to uh, activation of cell cycle and anti-apoptotic genes. And third, uh, it acts as a direct activ activators of uh, master transcription factors to lead to neurogenesis. So this is a paper uh, published by Dr. Numerous lab last year where they uh, looked at the, the role of alpharic acid in a rat uh, excessive cardiac arrest model. And what they found was that, uh, interestingly, at high dose, 300 milligrams per kilogram uh, infusion given immediately after ROSC, uh, valproic acid was actually protective, uh, so improved survival uh, of these rats up to three days after arrest. And it seems to be a synergistic effect with uh, TTM or hypothermia uh, therapy. And uh, so the question is, can humans actually tolerate this higher dose of valproic acid? And we know that from a first, uh, it's a phase one study that got recently completed by Dr. Alam's lab, that in healthy subjects, they seem to be able to tolerate up to 140 milligrams per kilogram. And this is actually essentially more than twice the dose that's FDA approved for seizure and bipolar disorder. So that's promising. With, uh, it seems that potentially, I think our patients can tolerate a much higher dose a day. So my hypothesis is that valproic acid improves the survival and neurologic outcome of out-of-hospital cardiac arrest patients. So in order to get to that phase where we can actually treat patients with valproic acid after cardiac arrest, there are several steps that needs to happen first. So um, in our mind, uh, we need to perform uh, dose-finding experiments in the swine cardiac arrest model and with the goal of uh, determining the pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics of this drug in a rest model uh, to, to ensure that it's in fact safe and tolerable in, this, in, this, in the animals. And then third, and importantly, to identify the biomarkers of target engagement so that we know who responds to the treatment and who we should target our therapies to. Then if things look, look good, we can translate these findings to a, a small early phase two clinical study, which could serve as a go and no go study for a larger adapted multicenter RCT. Uh, so these are my specific aims. So aim one is, uh, as I mentioned, to identify in a shorter survival model uh, optimal biomarkers of uh, valproic acid neuroprotection by using a PIG model of EFEB arrest. Uh, and the technique we're going to be using is our high throughput RNA sequencing. The second aim is going to be a survival study where we're going to be finding, uh, based on our biomarker studies, what would be the most efficacious dose. Um, and whether or not to confirm that indeed valproic acid can be neuroprotective after VFF arrest. 
So aim one. So this is the experimental model. Um, so we are uh, inducing VFIP arrest in our PIC model. It's an eight minute no flow untreated VFIP time. And this is to simulate the EMS treated model of out of hospital arrest. Uh, and so the eight, eight minute VFIP arrest is followed by 12 minutes of both manual and then Lucas uh, mechanical CPR. We then shock the pigs um, to uh, hopefully get ROSC. Um, and then we give them, uh, the pigs get randomized actually in the very beginning to either receiving placebo or escalating doses of alpharic acid. So 75, 150, 300 milligrams per kilogram over 90 minutes. Um, or um, we have a fifth group actually just strand operated controls where we uh, do instrumentation and anesthesia, but no cardiac arrest is another control. And I'll, I'll talk about the, the rationale for picking these three doses in a little bit. So the uh, treatment infusion will go over 90 minutes, and we watch these picks for up to two hours after end infusion, so essentially four hours from the initial time of arrest, and we euthanize them and collect samples. Uh, we collect serial samples for biomarker studies. So the question is, what is actually a protected dose uh, for in humans, right? So we know from, um, this is Barson day, so I had to find a picture for, for humans. Um, so we know from, uh, from prior studies that, uh, we don't know anything about the, the mice, but in rats, 300 mix per kg seems to be the protected dose in trauma and also in cardiac arrest. Um, in the pigs, uh, in the trauma pigs, uh, we know that 150 mix per kg seems to be enough. Um, and there's also species differences between uh, the animals. So as the size of the animal gets bigger, the percentage of free or unbound alpharic acid gets smaller. Uh, so you can see that in, in mice and rats, uh, essentially most of, the, most of the drug is actually free and not bound to albumin, so they're floating around being the active drug. Whereas when you get to humans, actually only about 10% is free at any given time. So that affects how you dose the medications. Uh, and also the metabolism. So the smaller the animal, the higher metabolism, the, high, the faster they metabolize the drug. So we don't know anything about what potentially could be effective in humans. We know that the 150 milligram per kilogram is probably about 60 to 90 milligrams per kilogram in humans, based on what we know from the data so far. So this is a, a pilot pig, an experiment that I did with um, our collaborator, uh, Dimitri Yanopoulos where we gave a dose of 150 milligrams per kilogram of valproate in uh, in, essentially infused our intra arrest in a very fast, rapid 10 minute rate. Um, and uh, the pig essentially got ROSC and he survived for 24 hours. And we measured the total level of free valproic acid and also free valproic acid level and compared that to essentially the calculated free level. What we found is that interestingly, uh, the, the actual levels were much higher, and this is under hypothermia, so the pigs were, the pig was about 30 to 33 degrees Celsius. It was in, in fact actually much higher than what we calculated or anticipated. Suggesting that potentially, uh, again, 150 mix per kg in, in pigs could be probably equivalent to a much lower dose in humans. So the whole rationale for uh, identifying biomarkers of target engagement in really any study is to to identify the responder. So we assume that, um, and we know this from cancer research, right? So what Kevin was talking about. We assume that all our critically ill patients are uh, you know, equal when in reality they're not. So you can start with an unselected cardiac arrest population. You give them a dose of alpharic treatment. Um, and if you can think of it as a bell curve, some of them are gonna be very responsive to the treatment and they're gonna have improved survival and outcome, a neurologic outcome, while the other end of the bell curve, they're gonna be non-responders, they may even have some toxicity. And I think part of the problem of our, you know, all these clinical trials fail to translate from clinical side is that we are analyzing all our results the same way. We're mixing all these responders with non-responders. So in order to get over that hump, we actually need to know exactly what we should be targeting our therapies to. We're gonna be employing a high throughput technique, which is hypothesis free in this particular aim, and that's with RNA sequencing. Uh, to, to get to the biomarker profile changes. Um, the other interesting thing I wanna try is that uh, we, I think traditionally we take a lot of um, assumptions. We make assumptions about what would be the most optimal uh, samples to collect from patients, and we do that through blood samples, and particularly with peripheral blood uh, molecular cells, the white cells. Um, but in reality, the, the, cheek, the buccal cells, actually, you do a cheek swab, and those cells actually have much more common um, 
profile compared to the neurons because they all both came from ectodermal origin uh, during neurogenesis. And so, so we're actually collecting blood samples, cheek swabs, and then we have brain harvest. We're going to be collecting these three uh, types of cells to see, compare them, uh, and see what ultimately. Uh, my hypothesis is that the buccal cells actually may be a better surrogate for, for the brain. Um, so this is one, uh, one pilot pig that we did recently. So this is an animal with the model that I talked about, the 8-minute FIFIP arrest with 12 minutes of CPR. We got ROSC. We infused 150 mix per kick of uh, valproic acid over 90 minutes. Uh, this, these are the hemodynamic uh, tracings of this animal. Uh, the, this pig was on a little bit of epi 0.25 mix, mics per kick per, per, per minute um, and survived for two hours after that. This is a higher dose that we recently do, 300 milligrams per kilogram. This book is actually a little sicker and needed a little bit higher uh, epinephrine infusion, but also survived for two hours uh, after infusion. This is the lactate trend. So the first animal, 150 milligrams per kilogram, lactate essentially peaked to at seven and stay there uh, throughout the experiment, whereas the, the, the higher dose, 300 milligrams per kilogram, uh, was much sicker, so went up to eight and then kept going up. So it's, you know, it's end of one, so it's hard to say whether this is just the animal was a sicker uh, animal from cardiac arrest or actually it was the valproic infusion that was causing the, uh, the severe uh, lactic acidosis. We also did some ultrasounds for, for, uh, to look at cardiac function. Um, so this is just the baseline compared to two hours after infusion. Again, uh, difference in epi dose requirement, uh, but more or less the uh, cardiac function, at least at least this is epi, looks about the same at the, toward the end of the experiment. Um, so AIM-2 is actually going to be, I'm not going to focus as much today, just given the time, but we're going to be actually um, probably doing a shorter duration of total arrest so that the pig can survive and get off the ventilator and pressors, um, and we're going to be uh, watching them for up to four days after uh, cardiac arrest, and again, career, collecting serial samples, but also uh, during each of the days uh, doing neurocognitive uh, studies to actually look at their functional status. Uh, and the dose of the valproic acid actually will probably be, uh, I would say probably 150 or 70, and or 75 milligrams per kilogram at a lower dose, and again, looking at the pharmacodynamics. And the, the future directions, um, you know, ultimately the goal is to I think the next set of goals is to actually add the targeted temperature management, the hypothermia part to this, and see, actually confirm the transition effects and see how that translates into our clinical uh, uh, early phase two study. Uh, so I'd like to thank a lot of people. So this is, these are, the top rows are my mentors. And so first and foremost, my, uh, my chair and, and mentor, Dr. Newmar, for giving me a job after fellowship and also opening doors to the K-12 and many other opportunities. Um, but this is really a team science approach where uh, this project would not have been possible without uh, the guidance and the help of uh, all of these people and many more. Um, and Dr. Rudley Ansbacher, so he is actually, um, so unfortunately he passed away in January from pancreatic cancer, but he's actually a, he's my launch committee uh, chair and he's a cardiac arrest uh, survivor himself from a couple years ago, actually got treated in our department and from there on he recovered um, and has made a huge, huge impact in my career already with the one year that I met him. Um, and also uh, Dr. Tiba, how come and your group for really just helping me with a big model and think this is gonna be a really fruitful collaborations. Um, and many more, and this is the clinical side of things where I get the opportunity to also work with our clinical, various clinical uh, and study coordinators and learning about uh, clinical trial design and execution and, and also definitely the EC3 colleagues and uh, nurses and my patients were giving me that uh, inspiration every day to go back to the lab and do some of this stuff. So thank you.